friends. We have them, we love them, we need them, but do they need us? Pray with me. God, we each need an experience with you. Thank you for seeing us. We need to see Jesus. Amen. The book of John is probably my favorite book of the Gospels. Um, and I think it's because, well, one of the reasons why is because John, he's just such a good writer. He knows how to write. He knows how to, to weave that, that, uh, that drama, that sincere drama with a with little bit of witty comedy thrown in there. He writes with suspense, um, but he's also aware of the, the, those epic themes of life and of spiritual reality. And his writing really reaches the heart. It's very unique. So to put in perspective where we are, um, if the book of John was a TV series on Netflix, it would be a classic must-see television show running for the past 2,000 years. Uh, but for whatever reason, maybe you've never seen it. Maybe, you've, uh, maybe people keep telling, me, telling you that you have to go and see this, this, this show. You have to go and see it. But you're like, ah, it probably is just going to be boring anyway. Because what kind of popular show could be named with something as simple as, as one word, like friends? Like, how could that be popular? But this, this one chapter, John chapter 1, it's, it would be considered the pilot episode, where all the main characters are introduced, okay? It's uh, showing you them one by one and how it all began. Uh, John chapter 1 sets it up carefully so that you get to know all the characters, relate to some of them, and then learn to love other ones. You already know uh, John the Baptist, the, that unconventional preacher that's out in the wilderness, and he's... He's preparing the plot for everyone who will come and hear his, his, his proclamation of, of repent for the kingdom of heaven is close by. And then there are other people who you'll be introduced to in, in a little bit. But if you'll turn in your Bible to John chapter 1, our story will begin in verse 29 of John chapter 1. John 1, 29. The next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. And I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Crowds were gathering around John the Baptist daily. They were coming out from the city, out into the, out into the wilderness, out into the desert. And he was by the Jordan River, and he was baptizing people. And, and crowds would gather there to watch him, to think about, about their own lives, and to watch other people commit their lives to God, to, to start a new leaf, to start a new life in, in God, in newness of life and sincerity. While these people are, are there, while this crowd is gathered and John is baptizing, this, the, some, some of the religious leaders come from the town too because now it's, it's popular to, to, to get baptized. And so the religious leaders come up and they're, and they're in their beautiful robes, they're in their beautiful garments that, that, that show their, their stature in society. And so as they, walk, as they walk through the crowd, just kind of parts, oh, it's, it's the rabbi, oh, it's the teacher, it's one of the teachers, oh, look, and these, this person, he, he, taught, he spoke last Sabbath, I remember that. And so as they, as they walk through the crowd, the crowd just kind of parts and they, they just kind of revere and they watch from the side and they come up to the front of the line and they're right next to John. 
And then John says, as John, he's looking at the crowd and he sees Jesus. Now, at this point, Jesus had already been baptized and he had already spent 40 days in the wilderness, 40 days wandering out there being tempted by Satan. And so when he comes back, he's, he's thin, he's frail, he he's, he's looks emaciated, he, he doesn't look, look like he did before. And when, but when John sees him, he recognizes him as the one that the Spirit had come down on before. And he says, behold, the Lamb of God. And, and you can imagine the people, which one, which one? Because he's standing right among them. And they're looking around, and you can imagine also the rabbis, when they look around, oh, he's here? Oh, you know, a celebrity effect takes on. And they're looking around, oh, the, I want to, you know, I want to get his autograph, you know, so he can sign my, my Pentateuch, you know, something like that. So there's like, there's this, this sense of celebrity about him. But there were also two men, Andrew and someone who's not named. And they're in the crowd also. They've been disciples of John the Baptist. And when they hear John the Baptist say, Behold the Lamb of God, they look at this, this, this thin, frail man and they go up to him and they say, Sir, um, where, where are you staying? And then Jesus says, come and you will see. It's really interesting that they would ask that question. Where are you staying? That's not usually the first thing, you know, when you, hi, my name is Brandon. Uh, and so, oh, hi, I'm, I'm so-and-so. Where are you staying? Where do you live? I'm like, no, I'm sorry. You know, nice to meet you, but uh, you're not going to get that information. But these, these two men, they come up to Jesus and they say, where are you staying? You see, they see that, that John the Baptist, he said that something is different about, about this man. And they want to know what it is. He's, something, he's the Lamb of God. He, they don't just want to be satisfied in their life with just, just meeting him by the riverbank, just shaking his hand, just listening to how his voice sounds. They want to spend time with him. They want to go to where he's staying and stay there too. They want to talk late into the night to hear everything he has to teach them, everything he has to share them. They want to follow him. They want to watch the way he lives his life. They want to watch him work with the people around him. They want to hear the words of God. And it's interesting that this is how they begin following Jesus, by finding where are you? Where are you staying? Because I want to be there too. And I think too much in my life, I think too much we, we don't ask Jesus, where are you at? We say, Jesus, will you be with me today? We're almost asking Jesus, will you follow me? Follow me around my life and the things that I have planned. But instead, these disciples do something completely different. They say, where are you staying? Where are you, Jesus? And in... Is, are, you, are, you in, are you in the wilderness someplace? Are you in the city? Is Jesus here in this city, in Hollywood of all places? Where are you staying? And so Andrew and this other nameless disciple, they follow Jesus and they go to where he's staying and they become his disciples. It's interesting uh, that, that John doesn't, describe, doesn't name this other disciple. And, and when you read through the book of John, this is, just, this is a spoiler alert. Uh, so John, he doesn't, he's very humble. He doesn't name himself. He says, even when he, he talks about himself, when there's no way to evade the, the story, he just says, ah, the one that Jesus loved, the, 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 and then the other disciple uh, came up to the tomb, you know, things like this. He doesn't want to say himself. He doesn't want to get in the way. He wants to stay out of, 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 this, of this, this story, this interaction, because it's about Jesus. It's not about him. But I look at my life, and I look at my ministry, and for the churches that I pastored before, and I see that I have gotten in the way. I've gotten in the way I've drawn people to Jesus, but also to myself. 
And, and when I had to leave, my time was finished, and I, I left, the people left those churches too. When I follow up and I, I talk to the, the current pastors of those places, they, 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 they fizzled out because they were drawn to me in some respect. And I wanted to tell you, just a little tangent, pastoral tangent, if you're here for me, don't. Stop. Stop it. Like, come here to be a part of this church. This is a church body. I am not the head. Jesus is the head. I, I might be like the spinal cord or like some blood vessels or a liver or something, but like, Jesus is the head, and we are each members of a body. So it doesn't matter what happens to the rest of the body. You are part, you are an intricate part of this body of Christ. And this is what we are here in Hollywood. So don't let me or anyone else get in the way. Uh, when, when Jesus is pointed out to John and to Andrew, they were ready and watching to leave. They were ready. They, God had brought them to John the Baptist, and they had been following his ministry, but as soon as, then they followed Jesus as soon as he was, as soon as he was pointed out. Um, they had been asking every morning, noon, and night, God, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to walk? What do you want me to, uh, how do you want me to minister? And they were asking God to lead them into deeper depths of his riches of knowledge and experience. And so when he called, they were ready. Uh, verse 40, John chapter 1, verse 40. One of the two who heard John speak and follow Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Uh, he first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. So you can imagine Peter sitting in his, in his fishing boat. He's sitting there fishing, and the catch is never as good as he wants it to be. He doesn't make enough money to... to uh, to make ends meet, uh, his, his job's a joke, he's broke, his spiritual life is DOA. Did you get that? And then, so Peter's sitting there, and his, <laughs> this is a bad one, I see some faces going like this. Um, there, then his brother, Andrew, he comes up to him and says, we have found the Messiah. And Peter, look at how he reacts. He jumps up, and he goes. And when Jesus meets him, he says, your name is Simon, but now you'll be called Peter. Jesus has this special interaction with just Peter, and he changes who he is. A um, little bit later, we have in verse 43, the next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the same city of Andrew and Peter. So we see that Philip already had a, a, a connection to some of these disciples. He already, and Jesus, even though Jesus comes up to him personally, he has a separate, he already knew some of these guys that were already following Jesus. He, he grew up with Andrew and Peter. They were, they were boys in the same town. They obviously played together. They obviously got to see each other grow up and then go off and do other things. And so when, they, when Jesus calls him, he says, yes, so he follows him, but then he sees, oh, hey, I already know some people here. This is cool. <laughs> and what's neat about the story of, of Philip is that the Bible doesn't even pause. It just, it just shows that, that when Philip is called, he follows immediately. There's no discussion. There's, no, no, there's nothing. It just, oh, and he follows, and he follows them. Uh, he has this very simple faith. And it's interesting how Jesus interacts differently with each individual along the way. Now we have in verse 45 something different happens here. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, well, you know, Nazareth does have a bad rap, 
but you know they've got a new superintendent of education, the high schools all now have iPads, um, the police are trying to clean up the streets, and you know you can't judge a book by its cover. cover. He doesn't say this. He doesn't try and argue with Nathaniel's uh, remark. Uh, he's just excited and he says, come and see. Verse 47, just, uh, Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And Jesus answers him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Philip was so eagerly, so excited about his discovery that it showed through his face, it showed in his voice, it showed in his heart. And he, he was all in this, in this unrestrained happiness. That's, that was, that's what he was giving out to everyone. But to which Mr. Sarcastic responds, can anything good come out of Nazareth? See, Nathaniel was a skeptic. Nathaniel was a skeptic because Jesus, but Jesus recognized in him one who, was no, who had no deceit. He was searching for truth. Nathaniel was searching for truth and wouldn't settle for anything less than it. You can hear it in his voice when he responds to Philip that in the past he had been duped too many times but th by things that were, were less than truth and he wasn't going to fall for it again. But Nathaniel does go and see and when, Nath and when Nathaniel does see when he does look at Jesus, all he sees is this, this poor guy wearing common clothes, not what everyone is expecting. Thin, tired, but with a, a, with a different expression on his face than he was expecting. And when Jesus sees Nathaniel, he says to him, Behold an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Verse 47, An Israelite indeed, Jesus says, by an Israelite, he's saying, you are someone who is truly wrestling with God. You are someone who is truly wanting to search after God, and you've spent your whole life trying to find him, but now you've found him. This, you are someone who's wrestling with him, who's an Israelite indeed, with sincerity of heart, not a hypocrite that, hypocrite that professes but does not truly desire a deeper relationship with God, someone who, who sought after God, but was dis so disillusioned by everything around him and was so unimpressed. To which Nathaniel replies, how do you even know who I am? You're not my friend on Facebook and I have everything on private. And Jesus replies to him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And then Nathaniel, this careful skeptic, shouts, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the, you are the, the king of Israel. And so this, um, this was apparently an A-B conversation because you can see that there's nothing in the text there to explain what the significance of this uh, fig tree is. Um, but we do have this, this key word, fig tree, that might give us a hint. In the books of the minor prophets, they sometimes allude to a fig tree uh, as a special place. And in those days, a fig, fig trees and olive trees were, were trees that were prized not just for their fruit, but for their shade and for their, their richness. And so when, when people had a piece of land, they would grow these trees, and that would be their like, special place where they would sit and be at peace. To be, to be where they, they're, they're, this was their zone. And so we have here this mention of a fig tree. I can imagine that this fig tree was the place that Nathaniel would go to do his deepest thinking, to escape from the world and to just sit there and wrestle with the questions in his mind. 
and his most intimate discussions with God is where, what he'd had of right there. And so Nathaniel answers, teacher, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And Jesus was all like, you think this was a big deal? You're going to see something greater than you could ever imagine. Now, Nathaniel, at this point in his life, he didn't need to rely on the testimony of somebody else. He didn't have to um, rely on somebody else's witness and experience with Jesus in order to believe because he had his own experience with Jesus, right? If Nathaniel had depended on, no, on the knowledge and experience of other people to meet Jesus, he never would have. He had to go and see for himself. In closing, there are some stories, through these stories we see Jesus reaching out to people Many different people with different experiences in different ways, but each person is, is reaching, is searching for him, and they're all connected. There's a brother, there's a friend, there's a neighbor, but they had their own experience with God. And my question to you is, have you gone to see Jesus for yourself? You've heard about him, but have you gone to see? Investigate for yourself. The experiences, that, the, the stories that I relate to you each week from up here, it's not enough. It's not even enough to get you to Monday, much less through Monday. Like you have to be coming to God for yourself each morning and each night, by yourself, you and God, wrestling under your fig tree. No one can have an experience with Jesus for you Many people might have come into your life and said, I found the Messiah, I found Jesus. Have you gone and see, seen for yourself? Do you follow Jesus? There are many people who confess to be followers, to have known Jesus their whole lives, but have never once brought anyone to him. To an awesome restaurant? Yeah. Yeah. To, to watch a show that they love, of course, but to bring a friend of theirs to their best friend? Now, when I say bring people to Jesus, uh, do I mean the church? Well, yeah, hopefully. But it would be nice, but remember that Jesus is, is so much greater than a building because he is a person. He is a person. And some of your friends might get to know Jesus might need to get to know Jesus through you before they ever step foot into your church building. But this requires time. It requires investment of energy and prayer. But love is simple. Do you want to bring your friends to Jesus? You have five friends here written down. I tricked you. Five friends here. What would happen if you prayed for these five friends every day? If you looked at these five friends every single day and you prayed for each one of them, what would happen? I have the name of a friend of mine here in the often overlooked friend category. What would happen if I prayed for him? If I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take his name and I'm going to stick it to the mirror in my bathroom. So when I'm brushing my teeth in the morning, I'm going to be praying for him. I'm going to be praying for my friend. And what is that going to do? I'm going to be thinking about him in the morning. And then later on that day, I'm going to be maybe sending him a text message, see how he's doing. The more I do this, the more I'm going to care about his daily life. And the more I do this, the, the more specific my questions are going to be. How, how, more than just how are you doing, but, but how can I help? How can I be a better friend? And not only this, but, but God is going to be working in his life too. So as I see changes begin to happen in his life, as I see him opening up to, to, to God and to a better way of life, my faith is going to be built too. So God is going to be blessing me in the process as well. He'll be moving in my life as well through my mindful prayers for this, for this person. Someday as 
uh, me and my friend get closer and my prayers continue, I'm going to ask him to come to my church community and ask him to come along with me to meet some of my friends here. Because, you know, some people, they're just waiting to be asked. They just want to be asked. And I know that once they come and see, more will be shown them than I could ever imagine. And so I say to you, I have found Jesus. Come and see. Come and see.